All right. Um, so welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining um, this extra meeting that we scooted in here to May. Um, we do have um, a few things to cover, um, but we try to, you know, formulate an agenda that was reasonable to talk about some interesting information. But um, we wanted to make sure that we had within each item, um, we've got Q&A time sort of built in. So we want to make sure that folks um, please interrupt us and ask questions about, you know, what we're talking about. And then we have set aside um, time at the end for open discussion as well. So we do want to make sure that we have plenty of time. Um, I know that we ran out of time at the last meeting. We had a lot to cover and we tried, as I said in my sort of cover email, you know, with the materials for this meeting, um, you know, we were, we got, you know, comments and questions that we, that we wanted to try and make sure that we covered in the meeting. So we, we ended up with an agenda that was pretty packed. So um, we heard, um, we know that folks want to talk. So we wanted to make sure we had time to do that tonight. So please, um, definitely interrupt us, ask questions. Um, that's what this time is for. So thanks for that. There's This is a very complicated project. We have a lot to do. And so um, thank you for working with us and in advance for your understanding and how we're trying to get through all of this material. So thank you. Okay. Um, if I may, I'm going to start on our presentation. Um, city staff is running this meeting. We don't have our consultants here tonight. This is an extra meeting and this was something that we could cover. Um, um, many of these topics are things that we have talked about with um, city council and planning commission, um, just given sort of how the calendar has worked and when we've had work session time um, with planning commission and city council. Um, and so now given sort of the date where we are now, um, we wanna talk about these, this material with you folks as well. So, um, so for the city councilor and planning commissioner here in the room, some of this probably feels familiar, sounds familiar to you, um, but um, that's, we wanna make sure that we're sort of vetting this with as many groups as possible um, as we work forward. So, okay, I'm going to share my screen and let's go here. Okay. All right. So if I may, um, folks can see my screen. Yes. Yes. For a presentation. Great. Okay. Um, again, just a um, another reminder, I guess, of our policy mandates for this project um, from our comprehensive plan. We want to provide housing choice throughout the city. We're trying to increase the tree canopy and preserve existing trees as part of this project. Um, and then do all of those things to enable middle housing, protect trees and manage parking all at the same time. So those are our mandates um, for this project. Um, the agenda was part of your packet, um, but I just kind of want to sort of lay out sort of what we're what we're doing here. We've got some process work. We're gonna talk about the open house um, a little bit. Then we've got a couple of sections to talk about some code amendments and some questions that we have about flag lots. So we're introducing kind of a new topic um, there for the group. We're gonna spend some time talking about next steps um, uh, as we go forward with the project. Again, we've got some open discussion time for the committee. Um, and then we do have course time for the um, for public comment um, as well that we're going to wrap it up and then we're going to get out of here that's it that's all we're doing tonight so it's pretty pretty simple i think it's kind of easy how a three-hour meeting can just be you know put together in one slide like that. Sorry. okay um project schedule so we are here in this you know draft code map sort of rec reconciliation phase we're in this refined code concepts looking at some code language and working towards um, some draft code and maps that's going to be here in the june um, 2021 um, schedule you've seen this schedule um, graphic or some form of this graphic before the change here and we're going to talk about this in much more detail in the next steps section towards the end of the meeting um, is kind of this final code adoption piece. Um, this is a lot, this is a big project. It's a complicated project. There's a lot to do here. Um, and final code adoption as we um, are envisioning this will be in the late fall, um, early winter. What's happening in June, this draft code and maps business here um, is a function of the DLCD grant that we received to help us pay for all of the work for this project. And that's the H, the House Bill 2001 
section of this. So the what we're envisioning or the way we see this is that that June deadline and that draft code for DLCD for the grant is what we think of as a milestone for this project. It's sort of providing this foundation bit of code um, that is House Bill 2001 compliant as far as the grant is concerned. And then we take it into the next phase, which is what we're calling the code adoption phase. And that is where we work through all of the work sessions and the details of the code to make it specific, um, even more specific and more nuanced for, for the city of Milwaukee. So this is a milestone in June. It's not the end of the project. Um, it's a milestone. And then we move into the next phase of the project. But Laura is going to talk about that more um, towards the end of the meeting. But um, I just kind of wanted to highlight um, sort of this piece of this graphic um, that feels a little different than what we've talked about in the past. Um, again, there's a lot to this project. We don't want to rush it. Um, we certainly don't want to bulldoze a bunch of stuff in that we haven't vetted and haven't talked through enough um, for the city. So we're hitting, we're coming up to a milestone, but that's not the end of the project. Okay, and again, more towards the end of the meeting, um, Laura has a whole section um, to talk about sort of the details of that code adoption process. All right. Um, we're going to move with there was a memo in your packet talking about um, the open house number two results um, and some of the things that we heard from folks and what folks said to us. Um, so I'm going to turn this over to Mary um, to talk. And I think, is there a question? Sorry, something sort of just flashed on my screen. Does someone have a question or a comment? Oh, uh, Stefan looks like uh, asked, do the consultants have to finish their portion by June 30th? Um, the consultant section comes up to June and then beyond June as well. So the way our contract is written with them, their scope of work does a couple of things, but part of it is that grant sort of deadline and then there's more budget and more tasks after that. We're gonna reassess once we get to that um, deadline. So good question, thank you. Um, okay, Mary. Yeah. Um, so some of this will be a little bit repetitive of what you saw last week. Um, wow, definitely not last week, but uh, last month. And um, so I'm just gonna go over, not everything from the open house survey, but things that more pertain to what we're gonna be talking about later on. So the questions and, and um, responses we heard that are gonna be, um, that we use to help formulate some of the code amendments that we're gonna be talking about later on. So. Um, just a snapshot of how the open house um, and survey went last month. We had 121 completed surveys, 68 people com participated in the comment section, um, along with um, com completing the surveys. And then we had 147 people either comment or com and or complete the survey. So um, some people decided not to complete the survey and just provided comments in the comment section, which was still really valuable. We had a lot of really good input that way as well. Um, so we had multiple avenues for people to um, participate, which was awesome. Um, and I see Lisa Beatty, you have your hand up. Feel free to ask your question if you have, if it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it okay. relates to this. I wanted Perfect. in the, um, in the comments we saw from Ronelle Coburn that were in our packet, she made some point about drop rate of people who look at the thing and don't fill it out. Do we know what that number is? Do we know how many people click on it and start looking at it and don't do any of these things, don't fall in any of these categories? We do. So the program Bang the Table, which is the application we use for this has numbers, but it's not totally accurate because it cannot assess if it's the same person coming back. So it could be um, it could be somebody that comes back multiple times and then the last time they do end up completing the survey, say, but it'll still count, say those all of those three times, and it looks like two of them it are two people that didn't complete it. So it's the numbers are a little um, misguided and that it looks a lot like there are a lot more people coming to the site and that's the same for um for just people viewing different pages and things like that you can kind of get a sense 
you can look at it as, as an overall sense of like, oh, you can see the numbers are dropping for each station as you go on because, and that's pretty typical. Um, but I wouldn't take the specific number very highly because it doesn't have that um, discrepancy of somebody coming back multiple times and they don't have the analytics in their toolbox to do that. As of right now, I think it's something that would be helpful in the future, but yeah, we don't, we don't know for sure. So I have been on a, some surveys where if you drop off, it asks you, it tries to give you a question of why, you know, it kind of pops up a box at you and says, you know, why are you leaving or are you sure you want to leave or whatever. Um, is there any discussion of trying to do that in any future survey so that we have a sense of? Um, if we do, I, I don't know how to do that in Bang the Table. And so it's something that I can ask like the people we work with at Bang the Table if that's an option. As of right now, I have not seen that option before. Maybe in SurveyMonkey they do that, um, but I know that we're wanting to consistently keep using Bang the Table, um, but that's definitely something I can bring up with them. Okay, yeah. thank you. I'm sure we're not the only ones that would like to see that sort of function. Right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. So like I said, I'm not gonna go over every part of the survey results because you, you hopefully saw that in your packet, but I'll go over some of the things that pertain to uh, some of the later topics we'll be talking about tonight. So in these two um, pictures, you can see here, the graphics show uh, responses around parking. So the, the bar chart there on the left-hand side is asking about how people feel about parking on street, either a mix uh, of on street driveway, just uh, off street or on your property or just on street. And you can see there um, only on-site parking um, was a pretty significant number of people not wanting that. Um, and so it looks like people are wanting a little bit more flexibility of um, counting parking, your required parking um, in different areas. So not just solely on site, so not solely on your property. Um, and then, but we did see on the right hand side there that um, there wasn't as high of a, a support for reducing the number of parking spaces required. So um, a good over half percent of people that took the survey um, weren't comfortable with um, going down less than one parking space per dwelling unit. So um, you can see there when we talk about parking later on um, that we took this, this information to heart pretty carefully as well as in our parking study that we talked about at our last CPIC meeting, there was that recommendation as well to, to keep the required parking at one space per dwelling unit. So we're seeing consistently that that seems to be something that the community also would like to see. So but again, we'll be talking more about that later though as well. Um, and this slide really is talking more about um, the actual building form itself for middle housing. And, and here you can see there's a, a case for people wanting flexibility. Um, on the left-hand side there on the bar graph, you can see uh, the building form for long and skinny is definitely higher really rated as not preferred in comparison to building forms being stacked or having multiple buildings. So the flexibility of wanting to say add a second story to, add, to create middle housing or even having multiple uh, cottages or multiple buildings on the same lot to count towards middle housing seems to be pretty favorable to people and they want that flexibility. They wanna be able to provide um, people with a lot of different choices on how they can create middle housing versus one specific type or things like that. Um, and then on the right hand side, you can see there it's not an overwhelming majority, but a good 58%, a little over half were um, open to the idea of supporting three stories if it meant preserving a mature tree. So that's not an outright people supporting three stories in general, but if it's talking about um, being able to preserve a mature tree and going up three stories, there was, people seem to be um, a little bit flexible there. Again, not an overwhelming majority, but it's, it's um, a little over half, so that's significant as well. And again, we'll be talking about um, 
how this plays into how we want to view middle housing on a site in particular about the multiple buildings will be um, something we'll talk about a little bit later. And we could see there, there's a 70% of people were um, pretty open to that idea. So yeah. And then the next one is talking about um, yards and then the size of the building, so lot coverage. Um, you can see here the middle, middle ground was the most popular choices that people chose. So in terms of what they thought about their yard size in between small and large, so medium, is um, something that people seem pretty comfortable with. Um, a large yard surprisingly got 19% of people um, supporting, and they could choose multiple of these. This was a multi-choice um, answer. So um, people tended to want to stick closer to um, middle-sized yards per se, um, and even a little bit more than large yards for a small yard too. So, um, and it kind of plays into with lot coverage as well. So obviously the bigger size the building, the less yard space you have. And people were pretty comfortable with staying within that middle lane of 35 to 50% lot coverage. And then obviously 35% or less was the next best and then 50% um, or more. So a property taking up or a building taking up more of the property was a little less. So people do value yards as well. So something else to consider when we talk about lot coverage and setbacks a little bit later on. And Dan, I see your hands up. I just wanted to offer a comment that when I went through the survey and looked at these questions, it struck me that for a lot of people, they might be reacting to the, <clears throat> the building design as much as the, mm -hmm. you know, the depictions of, of lot coverage or of the size of yards. And in some of these photos, the, the, the building designs are fairly significantly different, right? Um, so I think it's, it's worth taking with a grain of salt based on how things were presented. Yes, and that's that's a good point as well. Um, I think sometimes um, when you do the preference surveys that are visual, it can be, sometimes it's you're responding to what the actual picture is showing versus kind of the idea. But yes, agreed, take this with a grain of salt for sure. All right, any last questions? I think that was all I was gonna cover for the open house, but I'm happy to answer other questions that weren't pertaining to um, the things I talked about as well. I would just comment that I also think the parking question, if you go back to the parking slide, um, probably needs to be taken with a grain of salt because this, um, the no on-site, there was a choice of, you know, everything is uh, on-street parking counts and there's a choice of only on-site parking and it doesn't address the driveways. And so the middle one addresses the driveways and off-street, you know, on-street parking counting. And so it's kind of hard to know which one led to the vote because um, we didn't address driveways in any of the other questions and wasn't clear that driveways counted or didn't count in the other questions. So I just think, again, how the questions are worded, um, you know, does leave a little bit of a uh, fudge factor in what the results really mean. Yep, definitely. With any survey, there's going to be some, some, um, issues with how people respond to um, the questions. That's why survey writing is, is very difficult. But so yeah, I appreciate that feedback as well. I think to that point, um, Councilor Beatty, and, it, and it's a good one, um, you know, these are sort of the, the actual survey questions, but there were comments that people shared mm, as part true. of the, the stations that talked about um, parking as well. And so um, I think, you know, it seemed, you know, that there was sort of this idea of flexibility, you know, kind of generally 
um, as it related to parking as well. So we could draw, you know, at least some sort of general direction from even just comments that people made, not necessarily sort of the metrics of the of the questions too. But your point is well taken that obviously the way the questions are asked um, is important. Um, but then kind of looking at how some of the, the comments laid out too. And I think um, Kimmy included, you know, some of those sort of key takeaways um, from, you know, from the comments and so on as well um, might help us sort of give us a direction in, in how we go there too. But yeah, when the points. survey was live, I thought the comments were, I found reading the comments the most interesting part. Yeah. Sure. yeah. That's great. Okay. So I think it's all right. We're going to move, move on a little bit here um, and kind of get into more of the um, House Bill 2001 um, sort of topics. And again, um, what's important here, you know, I just want to reiterate is that you know, the comprehensive plan is driving, you know, the code amendments. Um, and secondarily are the requirements of the state law itself and, and the House bill. So I just want to walk through a bit of the House bill piece um, for requirements and how the city um, is, is looking to comply with the House bill. But again, sort of the primary or sort of the foundation of these code amendments is um, are the policies um, from the comprehensive plan. Um, and there was some discussion in the in your in the staff, I keep calling it a staff report, in the memo <laughs> that went to you folks about the relationship between the House bill and the model code. Um, and the reason I'm sort of, I'm introducing this idea, we haven't talked too much about the model code itself, um, but I know folks, or I think um, some folks might be familiar with the fact that, you know, there are the House bill requirements and then this model code was created um, by DLCD um, to provide sort of this base template code that communities could um, could adopt. It provided it provides guidance in how to implement um, the House bill, um, and for communities that don't adopt the um, provisions of the House bill into their own codes by the deadline, then that model code will apply directly to the city. It just sort of happens to you if you don't um, change the code um, to comply with the House bill, and a city has choices. Um, to adopt the model code as it is, adopt portions of the model code, um, or adopt a completely new code that still meets um, Division 46 or the actual House Bill um, language. And for um, and I, the way the House Bill or the way the model code is written, it's intended to be written as sort of a a code that um, makes building um, or developing middle housing as simple and as streamlined as possible. So it's intended to be the way the state would see a code that is intended to definitely provide as much opportunity for, um, for housing as possible and has things like smaller setbacks and, and various things like that. And the reason why I'm bringing it up here is just to understand that the, you know, that the city um, is not adopting the model code. That's not our goal. That's why we're going through all of this process, of course. Um, we're going to be developing a code that does comply with the House bill, but in a way that is um, unique um, to or, and is context sensitive to the city and kind of what are the goals of, of the community. Um, but we are sort of looking to the model code to help guide some of our recommendations and, and kind of see how the model code addresses um, some of these things. So um, in some ways I've, you know, I've heard in, in various meetings, well, but the model code says X. And so I just wanted to kind of provide a little bit of context for the group as far as what is the relationship between the House bill and the model code and, and the way we um, are proposing to move forward with our own code. It's not to adopt the model code. We're looking at it again to see kind of what it says and, and how it approaches some of these things. But it's really about making sure that we're in compliance with the House bill. Um, and we might use the model code as a check or kind of see how it might recommend some certain things. But but we're sort of going, going at it with, with our own eye towards compliance um, with, uh, with the House bill itself. So in case folks were wondering, um, what are we doing with the model code? Um, we're just using it as a guide and we're not, we're not looking to adopt it. So while we're on the topic of the House bill um, and kind of how we're going into some of the code, um, we wanted to talk about a couple of kind of key issues or key questions and things. We've got some polling questions that we want to include here for 
um, with the group um, and start talking about um, some of the specifics as we move forward to prepare um, for the code recommendations that the consultant team is working on um, and kind of what we will be talking um, with you about um, for the June CPIC meeting. So if we could start with parking, kind of hearkening back to what Mary was talking about um, for parking. Um, the house bill requirements are that a city cannot require more than one parking space per dwelling unit. And um, what our current code requires, that's title uh, chapter 19.600. Um, and we've talked about this before in this group is that um, our current code requires one space per dwelling unit um, for a single unit home or a single family home. Um, and in multifamily um, or multi-unit developments, if a unit is over 800 square feet, we require 1.25 parking spaces. Um, so we need to address that, of course, in our code. Um, and then for single unit dwellings, we also have these locational requirements for our required parking spaces. Um, and our required off street parking spaces need to be outside the front yard setback. So our code is effectively requiring two parking spaces. So that's how we, when we've been talking about, can the driveway count as your parking space? Um, that's that idea um, of, not requiring that parking space to be in a garage um, or sort of to the side or basically set far back. Um, we're, we'd like to be able to provide some more flexibility and allow for that driveway to be the parking space. So this is the graphic that we use that's actually in our code to illustrate where that parking space is required to be right now in our code. Um, so what we're, um, again, the house bill, we can't require more than one parking space. Um, and our recommendations for the code going forward is to amend the table within the code. So it really is one space per dwelling unit and to amend that graphic or that section for the residential off street spaces to allow that required parking space to be inside the front yard setback, to allow for that driveway space to be the, um, the one parking space that's required. Um, so that's kind of where we are recommending that the code go forward based on everything that we've heard um, from folks. Um, and I think we have a poll question right about here, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but I think I, I thought I saw, I think a, there are a couple of hands up maybe. Sorry, my little window came down and I can't tell if that meant that there were some questions. I don't see any hands. No, okay. I also don't have a poll question. Oh, Dan has a hand. Okay. I just raised my hand because you gave me the opportunity. Um, <laughs> sure. Apologies if you've stated this before, but mm -hmm. where is the setback measured from? Is it relative to the right of way and to the sidewalk and to the street? Yes. So um, it's a great question. Um, so your your the setback is measured from your front property line, but depending on where your property is, it might not be that obvious. Um, if you have a fully developed um, street at your house. So there's the street curb sidewalk and so on. Generally, it's the back of sidewalk is going to be your front property line. And it's from there um, where it gets a little bit difficult. And I'll say surprising for some folks when they call us and ask us questions is when that street is not developed and there isn't a sidewalk or anything like that. And they think their property line is at the edge of the pavement of the street. But that may not be the case. A lot of people's front yards look and feel bigger than they actually are because they're, the street right of way is actually in their yard or what looks like their yard. So it depends. Um, so we have GIS maps that can help try and figure out about where your front property line is, um, but it isn't always the edge of the street because it depends on if the right of way is developed. I don't know that I've answered your question very well. I just can't. It's it's at the edge of um, the right of way uh, boundary, but that's not always obvious. Depending you on did the, answer my question. Okay. I guess I was seeking clarification about whether allowing parking within the setback might mean a vehicle blocking a sidewalk if one exists. And I think the answer is no. No, no, definitely not. No, yeah, the sidewalk is in the right of way. That's public property. That doesn't mean people don't park that way, <laughs> but that's not, that wouldn't be the required parking space. Yeah. So, so if we don't have a poll question about this, can I sort of generally, um, I just wanted to understand from the group, 
um, is the group generally feeling pretty favorable or are you feeling favorable about um, having the one space per dwelling unit, but more importantly, that the one off street parking space that is required can be in the driveway, that it can be inside the front yard setback. Does that sound, maybe I should stop sharing so we can see a thumbs up from folks. Are we feeling okay about that, we think? Great. Cool. Oh, that's what it is. There's a couple of chat comments. That's what I saw, I think, so. Okay. We don't really have a choice about the one per unit, do we? Correct. We do not have a choice, but we can go. We, if folks have a feeling about being less, that could be something certainly to talk about. Um, but requiring the one, um, and again, this doesn't sort of get to, you know, there was some notion about some flexibility about using on street spaces, but that's not where we are right now. That's those are some of those nuances that we're going to get to sort of in the next phase of looking at the code and what are those circumstances where an on street space might count. Um, that's not something that we're recommending, certainly not universally. Um, we don't have right of way everywhere where that that can make sense um, or that could work, but um, the one space per dwelling unit that's a requirement. Um, what we can um, change or address within our code is where that parking space is. And that's sort of this in the driveway um, would sort of reduce kind of what we've been requiring so far to give folks more flexibility in their site, allow for, and not even for new development, this allows people to be able to um, convert their garages into living space. That's something that we see a lot of. And I think we talked about that at a few, a few meetings ago about an example that that can be difficult for folks with existing development right now, not even trying to expand stuff. Um, but that's, that's more the key question for the group is this driveway versus garage, I guess, option, I suppose. So uh, I, I have a question about, mm -hmm. um, is there consideration about a proximity to public transportation and reducing that, um, especially like multifamily below one unit per one parking space per unit, um, or even just single family home, of course, just trying to, to, to have some kind of guideline in which um, the, that calculation really is attached to what public transportation options are available within, right. you know, 10 minute proximity. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's, um, I'm happy to have, you know, if folks wanna have that conversation and let's talk about that. I think I would put that discussion in the same kind of bucket of discussion as, you know, as allowing on street spaces to count as off street spaces, that that's, these are these nuances that are outside the house bill requirement. Um, and that's something that, you know, that's kind of, unique or personal to what Milwaukee's code is going to have and locational you know, requirements and things. We do have um, kind of by right reductions for off street parking in commercial air, you know, in the downtown, you know, and those kinds of things. It's sort of a new idea to be at, to be um, including that as something for sort of the larger residential development, you know, areas in town. And I think that's something that, I think it's on the table for us as a community to talk about, certainly. Um, so I think that's sort of in the mix of how to create some, create more flexibility with, you know, with on-site develop, with development on a site. But um, there's just, there's more to talk about with that, I think. And it's going to go to, you know, is, do we have the kind of transit that makes that a, a viable option, mm -hmm. you know? But it's a great question, Jennifer, for sure. Um, and sorry, just transit is. One more, one more quick question. Um, you know, as I think about developing a cottage cluster, fitting enough parking onto the lot is really challenging. If the lot can comfortably handle, let's say, eight to ten little cottages, but then the, but then the parking is, you know, if if on street parking is not counted, that becomes problematic in making cottage clusters possible for small time developers like myself. So wanting to do the right thing, but then being stymied by something like, well, I need to find 10 parking spaces on a really little lot, which is pretty unsightly actually, because when you're sticking a parking lot 
in the middle of what is supposed to be this lovely shared communal garden area. <laughs> so th that's the context in which I'm asking mm -hmm. too. And Jennifer, we haven't gotten to college cottage cluster conversation yet, but we're hoping to get there. So we'll talk a little bit about the next steps and that's that's on our agenda. We just haven't had that conversation yet, but sure. yeah. Thank you. Any other thoughts about parking at all? I did notice that uh, on one of our multitudes of handouts, there was a chart that talked about allowing different kind of um, commercial uses in zones. And I know we're not going there, but parking structures was one of those items. And so, you know, I keep coming around to this idea that there's, I think there's alternatives that we haven't explored about accommodating parking, um, ones that have been mentioned and those that, that haven't been mentioned or are known at this point. Um, so I'm, I'm just wondering when that consideration comes into this topic, if, if it doesn't have to do with um, residential zoning specifically. I think I'm not clear on where you mean we've been talking about commercial uses within the residential zones. I don't, I don't remember that being part of the. Well, well no, you know, the, there, uh, and when there was initially some um, information provided about what was what type of usage was allowed in different zones, mm -hmm. there was part of that chart. It was back from December, I think was a list of commercial uses, you know, bars, this, that, blah, blah, blah. And the last thing was parking structures. So parking structures to me is a way of accommodating parking. Right. And yeah. it's not residential, but it, it would, it's a way of us saying, okay, we have a, a need for the housing, we have a need for the trees, we don't have enough space for parking. Um, what about other creative possibilities? Mm -hmm. One of them was talked about in Rennell's document. Mm -hmm. It happens to be my idea. I've brought up several variations of this, trying to think creatively about grouping cars instead of a parking. But since since we're not allowing for that discussion uh, of other options besides what's being presented, I'm just wondering if we're eliminating the possibility of having a, a other options besides what has been presented as either on the street, I think that's literally on the street, and in driveways and or setbacks, garages, whatever. So to me, there's another category. Mm -hmm. No, you're right. And Rennell, and in Rennell's letter, it did talk about this idea of car parks or sort of these like neighborhood parking areas. And I think that is that is something that that can be discussed, certainly as an idea. Um, I think, again, and again, Laura is going to sort of talk about sort of where what this process is for this whole code adoption process. Um, right now, as far as how to comply with the house bill, um, it's, you know, one parking space per dwelling unit that that that's, we can require less. Um, and but we can't require more, I think where we can start think we can think you know, more about sort of where do these parking spaces happen that we're requiring. Um, so I think, I guess in a nutshell, um, Renee, how, what I would say is that nothing is off the table. So I think that that can be a discussion point sort of in kind of our next, in our next round of looking at these various code 
um, options and how we kind of personalize the code, um, you know, for us. And, and, you know, where do those car parks happen? Who owns them? Who maintains them? Is it city property? Is it private? I mean, there's, there are a lot of facets to that, um, but it's an interesting idea. Um, I don't know too much about where those have happened in other places. And so I think, you know, we'd need to do a little more research about how that might work. Um, but I'm certainly not discounting it or sort of, or um, saying it's it's not workable. I think it's something you know we can work through and see if it's if it makes sense um, and see how it might work. But yeah, I mean, I'm just going to say nothing's off the table right now as we're working through that stuff. Yeah, there's just some details to figure out. Councillor Beatty. Yeah, I would just say that I mean, as a sort of follow on to that and a coral corollary to what. Renee and Ronell are talking about at the council discussion last week, um, not this, yeah, anyway, the council discussion of this last week, um, the mayor, I mean, we talked about the idea of uh, redesigning streetscapes, that we could use parking as a way to um, create more, you know, sort of a different streetscape where maybe you have angled parking on one part of a block and, um, and then angle parking on an, the other side on another part of the block and you use that to make the street meander and to make, to slow people down, um, that there could be, you know, sort of street redesign that concentrated parking in some places and took away the need to have it all be on the property. But all of that is kind of beyond the scope of this first phase of, of comp plan implementation. I mean, staff made that pretty clear that that would be a discussion for the transportation system plan work, which comes sort of next. Um, so we'll have to enact something as a requirement now, but that doesn't mean in two or three years, we might not be revisiting how we place parking in the neighborhoods. I think also, I'm not going to speak for Sharon, but I remember Sharon mentioning to, I think at least to me, maybe to us all, of the idea of um, having car sharing count towards um, parking as well. So that's something to, we can think about as well, which I thought was an interesting idea. And I think what some of these things make me think of is sort of what is the, um, you know, right now we have in our current code, we have a parking modification process where, you know, here's what the code requires. You can request less or more, frankly, if you're going over the maximum, but it's generally what the, you know, what's less. And we have a process for that, that if there's something unique about your site or you've provided for, I'm going to make this, you know, a whole bunch of car shares and all of these things so that you don't need to provide all that on-site parking because you've made these other accommodations um, to provide for um, vehicle, you know, um, use for your tenants or something like that. Um, that there's a process where you know an individual project can go through to request less parking, and you know, and we have approved those things before. So um, I think as part of this entire mix, um, you know, maybe that's. The kind of process that we can be thinking about for you know residential developments as well and what might some of those approval criteria might make you know what those might be um, so i think there's a way to think about it as kind of a clear and objective standard that you know here's a way for you to provide less parking or um, you know here's an avenue for these one-off interesting you know kinds of projects to be able to do something different and there's a way for us to approve that kind of on a case by case basis if there's a creative application or you know something like that so i think um, i just kind of want to offer that that we already have a process like that in our code and maybe that's the kind of process that you know could apply to something like um, a residential development as well it just isn't typically that way but we're introducing different residential developments now into our neighborhoods that we that the code obviously never anticipated that's why we're rewriting it so you know there may be a way to do that um, even within the you know in our existing system of a parking modification type of application too so that we don't maybe don't need to think about every possible way of doing some of these things there may be a way for a creative developer to, to or an applicant to just to do that now um, without us kind of creating a whole code section about it 
I just wanted to offer that up that there's a way we could just we may be able to just do it, you know, within our existing structure too. And that could work with Jennifer's idea of absolutely a cottage cluster mm -hmm. has this creative idea yep. of needing less parking, but they're meeting it this way. Some or, other way. I don't mm -hmm. know. Yeah. 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 So something to think about as well. What's that process? What would you call that? A variance? We call it, it's actually called a parking modification. And okay. so if that's an actual application, um, so it's, it's not a, you are varying the requirement, but it's not an actual variance. It's a parking modification. Because of, co of course we have to have, we have to call it something different. So we do in the code, but, and it's a specific code section and I'm happy to send that out to folks, you know, to um, a link to that section of the code. And you can read, it's been used before, you know, for other projects generally, um, more, I think it hasn't been used for anything kind of like what we're talking about here, but I can see how it might be applicable actually. Um, and some of the things that we ask for folks to provide, you know, similar developments have used, have had this many parking spaces. We think it can work here and here's why. And, you know, it gets evaluated through a type two process. So neighbors get, you know, get notified, um, but it's not a planning commission decision or something like that. It's something that stays, you know, it's a slightly um, lower level of, of review in that way. But that might be something to, that we could, maybe tweak a little bit to apply to something like, like Jennifer's, like a cottage cluster or something like that. Yeah. And Vera, this is just going to be my friendly reminder to keep an eye on the time. Yes, ma'am. Last, time, yes, last time we didn't get through everything. We didn't have enough time for everybody. Yep. I've got six minutes to get through the rest. I know. Here we go. <laughs> Ready? That's why I had coffee today. Oh, Joseph, question. So I was just going to say that um, I think it I think it'd be great if you could send out the parking modification code, and um, I think that'd be a great thing for us to review in this context and to really think about how the newly adopted comp plan policies could um, improve uh, upon uh, that process that we already have, and mm -hmm. how we could make it easier for things that satisfy more policies to go through that process and um, and a little bit more challenging where it doesn't satisfy the policies. Uh, yeah, you know, if that seems appropriate. Yep, will do. All right. Laura, thanks for watching the, the clock. Um, let's continue to do that, please. Thanks. <laughs> okay, great. Um, okay, let's get back to some more, some more things to talk about. Um, okay, um, next is to talk about um, ADUs. Um, accessory dwelling units um, and duplex standards. So this is something that um, we brought up. Um, we're kind of thinking about this as sort of, I'll call it sort of a low hanging fruit or a semi simple kind of code um, amendment or recommendation. Um, currently, uh, we require land use review um, for ADUs and duplexes in certain areas. And what that means is that there's an actual land use application. It doesn't go to building permit. So there's this extra layer of review. Um, our comp plan policy number 7.2.4 um, does call for simplifying ADU and duplex permitting. Of course, the house bill requires that duplexes must be permitted on all lots that allow a single unit dwelling. Um, and since single unit dwellings or single family homes go through no land use review, like they can just go straight to building permit unless they need a variance or something. And that's what we're trying to square with this is that single unit homes, ADUs, duplexes, you know, all of these middle housing types are all, you know, we lay out the standards, you go to a building permit, there isn't a land use review um, required. So what we're recommending is that ADUs and duplexes are permitted by right, that they go to a building permit, you know, subject to design and development standards, of course. Um, and if we need to, you know, revise some of the design standards to comply with state law, we would do that. And we're still kind of looking through that. I don't know that we need to do too much of that. But again, the recommendation is to align ADUs and duplexes um, with single unit homes, certainly, and keep them in a, um, a by right, no land use review um, process. So I don't know if I hope I made that relatively clear to understand. Are there any questions about that recommendation to kind of align all those things together in a by right format, no land use review, no land use application required? 
Okay. I'm going to continue on. Okay. Um, I think we've seen this map before, the consolidated zones. Um, uh, and again, we are not married to any of these names. R1 and R2 are not the are not the recommended names, but there that's just what we're calling them. Um, the R1 are these orange, what are currently our higher density zones. Um, and then the R2 would be the consolidation of the R5, R7, and R10 zones. And so this is what the map um, would look like. This is not a requirement of House Bill 2001, um, but it is a comprehensive plan recommendation to simplify our residential zones. And we've talked about this before in this group, um, but this was the, um, this is sort of that final map. Um, and what we want to talk about, um, and this was in the, in the staff report or the memo that went out in your packet, um, were some of these um, ideas um, and questions about some of the standards that would apply to these zones. Um, and what this chart, and this chart was in your staff report or in the staff report, and the key question um, here, again, some of this is House Bill 2001 driven um, as far as the, you know, the lot size for the different house, residential housing types, um, but it's also from the comprehensive plan, you know, trying to open up and provide more opportunities for housing throughout, throughout the city. Um, generally, um, and this is what we've come to understand from, you know, the consultant team and working in other communities and with, um, you know, developers and so on, generally there are three things that affect the price of a home. Um, the lot size, the unit size, or the home, the house size, and any regulatory barriers. And those are things that the city can control. We can't control the construction cost. We don't control lumber costs or any of those things, of course. Um, but some of the things that we've been thinking about um, are this idea of being able to reduce those things. You know, can we provide opportunities for less expensive homes? Um, I think, you know, the notion of affordable housing is something that is um, sort of in a different bucket of things. Um, but the idea is, you know, can we provide more opportunities, more flexibility for more things within our residential zones? And is there a way that we can help try to provide an opportunity for less expensive housing? Um, and one of the key ideas within um, this sort of example of our residential two um, table of standards is this idea um, of a smaller lot size for single unit homes and duplexes because duplexes have to be permitted on lots that allow for a single unit home. When we've been thinking about, you know, triplexes must be permitted on a lot of 5,000 square feet because that's what the house bill says, or a quadplex has to be permitted on a lot that's 7,000 square feet. Um, we realized as we were thinking about it, well, what is the base lot size for a single unit home, for a single family home? Um, is it 5,000 square feet to kind of stay with sort of that triplex idea or the R5 minimum lot size? What if we thought about a smaller lot size for that single unit home um, and a duplex? What if we provided, you know, a smaller lot size for opportunities for more home ownership opportunities for these smaller homes? Because we'd still be applying, of course, setback standards and lot coverage, but we would be allowing for a smaller lot than we currently allow. So the key question or sort of the key idea here is, you know, this idea of a 3,000 square foot lot for a single unit home or, um, or a duplex. And that's kind of, that's certainly not something that is permitted today um, as far as a, you know, lot size. We do have code language that says that if it's an existing lot, that somehow got created who knows when, um, then we do allow for a single unit home to be built on a 3000 square foot lot, but you couldn't create one right now. Um, that's too small. So um, what we'd like to understand from, the, from, from you folks from CPIC is this idea of allowing for a 3000 square foot lot um, for a single unit home. So this idea of this option two um, kind of discussion of these lot sizes and then you know, this is what kind of housing would be permitted on it. And then we've tried to sort of think about what those standards might be that would apply to this category of lot sizes for setbacks and, and lot coverage. Um, and Mary, remind me of when we have the um, polling question, because I'm trying to remember if I go to the next slide or if there's a poll question now. Um, 
Well, Here's. the poll question is about if people, how would they feel um, with a single unit dwelling or a duplex, should they be allowed on 3,000 yeah. or five, or stay with mm -hmm. the current code, which is 5,000 right. okay. um, square feet. But I guess before I do that, are there any questions about that? Does anyone want to want further information before we we go? Okay, I think Jennifer's got a yeah. question. Yeah, of course. Yeah, uh, my question is, does that, because 3,000 square foot lots don't currently exist, except when they're the anomaly, right? Right. Um, is the desire there or the vision that lots that are bigger are subdivided such that people could own a home on that 3,000 square foot lot that is more affordable conceivably? If I'm understanding your question, then yes, that's sort of the idea that we're allowing for a smaller lot, which would result in a smaller home, which would hopefully result in a less expensive home than, you know, what we might normally find. So that's kind of the, you know, it's, it's not perfect, you know, we can't control the market and that kind of thing, but we can try to make things we think more affordable by making allowing things to be smaller, you know, for folks that are affordable housing builders, you know, community land trusts, those kinds of folks, um, you know, a market rate developer would generally not build on a 3000 square foot lot, you know, but can we provide an opportunity for some of these smaller things to, you know, to happen to help um, in affect or impact, you know, the resulting price, you know, of those, of those homes. So yeah, that's, that's sort of, that's the idea um, of allowing for these smaller lots like this. Certainly, you know, a 1500 square foot lot, that's, those are row house and townhouses, that's already in the house bill. Um, if a cottage cluster were developed um, and were divided to be able to create separate lots for a cottage cluster specifically in a cottage cluster kind of development, then that 1500 square foot lot would be for those cottages because those are limited in size already. This is sort of kind of outside of that idea. Yeah. Thank you. I think we had Renee next and then Celestina. Um, my, mine is more of a, a comment than a question. I, I don't really, think in terms of square fo footage. So I think in terms of measurements, and if I think about a 3000 square foot lot, it's about, you know, a little over 50 by 50. So visually, I'm trying to think what kind of house within our development standards could fit on a lot that small and still have a place for uh, a car and and have any kind of um, trees of any size. I, I just, you know, I'm, I'm coming from m my perspective, obviously, which I live on a third of an acre. So it's, um, you know, I, I, I can't imagine living on a size that small, but I, I can't even, I don't even know what's feasible. Vera, mm -hmm. would it be okay if I shared my screen? Please, please. Okay. Yep. I actually attempted to make something <laughs> and then we ended up scrapping it. But now that I've made it, I think it might be helpful. Did you um, know I was going to ask that question? I didn't know, but uh, I thought people might <laughs> might have want to know what that could look like. Um, let's see. Mary, we'll you're supposed this. to say, Renee, I know you so well now. I know exactly <laughs> what kind of questions you're going to ask. I'm thinking of you. Um, so this kind of gives you an idea of, there's a lot of stuff on here, so I apologize. But if you stay over on this end here, um, a lot size that has 3,000 square feet, uh, that is a 35% lot coverage. So that's just the footprint of the building can have a footprint of just a little over a thousand square feet. Now it could go add another, um, it could add another story. So it'd be two stories that adds 2000 square feet right there total for a house. And that's keeping with the 20 foot rear yard setback, 20 foot front, um, five feet 
on one side. If it's next to a street, it would need to be 15 feet side or otherwise it would be five feet. So hopefully that gives you in terms of like what a house size could be if they full build out, if they went straight for 35% lot coverage, they could build say a single story, just a little over a thousand square feet, two story, it would be double that. Is that helpful, Renee? Oh, you're muted. Oh, you're still muted. Oh, sorry. I was trying to break that down into dimensions of the house. So that's uh, a thousand square foot um, footprint. Yes. So that, I mean, that could be that? like, um, whatever, hold on, that could be, it'd be like a 35 by 30 foot house, if that makes sense. Yeah. 35 by what? 30 feet. Okay, I'll take your word for it. Thank you for the illustration. Yeah. I just want to do a time check um, here as well that we're sort of, I know that I know we're, we're trying to stick to, you know, trying to make sure that we cover all these things, but we we do have other stuff to talk about. Well, we still have Joseph and Celestia. Yep, no, nope, that's up. fine. Yeah. I'm just, you know, yeah, yeah, just yeah. kind of pointing out. Yep. Yeah. Do we want, is it, do you want me to stop sharing? Yeah. yeah. Okay, then we can see everyone. Yeah. So, I don't know. Joseph, do so, you want to go ahead? I just well, I think Celestina was next. Okay. All right. Um, howdy, everybody. Um, I actually, something that uh, Jennifer said in her question um, made me curious specifically about subdivisions and a conversation that I recall from a couple um, sessions ago about how we can have a, a diversity of housing, obviously, um, while also maintaining some of the larger lots and what that offers. So obviously allowing for these smaller lots in some cases, um, but the question of the, um, you know, how many, for example, 3000 square foot lots do we have in Milwaukee right now? Not very many. And then the following question being, what is the process for subdivision? And are there any protections to maintain a diversity of lot size? And um, maintain some of our larger lots. So I think that is my only outstanding question on this topic. Thank you. Well, I think Jen, I, it, I'll just take sort of a general stab at um, answering your question. So Celestine, it sounds like you're, um, you know, right now, I mean, we don't require a diversity of, of lot sizes within a subdivision. It needs to meet the minimum lot size. So, um, you know, we can cert, you know, that's on top of, you know, what do folks, you know, when a subdivision comes in, you know, what kinds of lots or what kinds of homes is someone looking to build? We do have sort of our, you know, tree canopy, you know, tree code requirements that will be, you know, will be part of that and parking and all of these other things. But um, could I envision a subdivision of multiple 3000 square foot lots? I, it's possible. Um, I think, are you suggesting that we should be thinking about, um, code language that would somehow require different sizes of lots. I mean, what we're, you know, our code at, you know, kind of how it's sort of looking at this point is sort of this idea of the house type is driving the lot size. Um, but it sounds like you're, you're asking about doing something um, different from that and, and asking or and thinking about, you know, having a development that's going to be built, creating multiple lots that there should be um, multiple sizes of lots so that um, there are more. I houses. can clarify. There you are? Okay. I can clarify a little bit. And I was thinking more like across the city, what's the impact? So how, I don't know if there are any levers um, that can be used. 
uh, let's see, how do I art- articulate? I'm not talking about a single subdivision mm. creating or a single lot being subdivided into multiple lots of multiple sizes. I'm more getting at, you know, if we, um, how do we retain some lots citywide, a diversity of lot size citywide? I think that there is, mm-hmm. I hear from neighbors, I hear a lot in this, in our communities about not wanting all of our lots to become, for example, 3,000 square foot lots, yet also people who understand that some of that is reasonable and can be absorbed and has benefits. And so I don't know on a, on a broader level what mechanisms we have. I mean, it would be a frenzy if we just said, you know, <laughs> there are only this many subdivisions that will be issued ever you know, because we have to maintain the rest of the large lots, that would probably be a mess. So I don't know what the level, what the levers are, but that's Mm -hmm. the only thing that this question is bringing to mind is the more um, we lean in that direction, is there a way to retain some of the larger lots? Okay. That's a good question. And I guess a reminder too is, um, Yeah, this would only happen if people chose to partition their lots, but you could build multiple units on one lot right? as well. Um, Joseph, was Joseph next? I'm sorry, I don't know who's- Yeah, I think so. So, Joseph and then Stefan, and then we'll move on to another topic. Great. It sounds to me, you know, again, it, it just starts to really feel like, you know, between the lar- the more dense zone, you know, the R1 and the R2, the, the you know, less dense zone, really what we're focused on here is um, a standard around lot coverage and setbacks, and that we're really trying to preserve more um, open space in the larger, you know, the less dense zone. And so... Um, it just really feels to me like, you know, we're trying to, to overcomplicate this. And, um, you, you know, and I think um, Renee's question really got to the heart of, you know, kind of what I'm thinking about, which is that, you know, at some point you're really starting to push the limits of physics in terms of what you can fit on a site, no matter how big it is. And so um, why would we require a minimum lot size, why not just let the market decide, you know, if they can fit a duplex with two ADUs or if they can fit a quadplex or if they can fit a cottage cluster or if they can, you know, whatever, and they can meet all the parking requirements or get a parking determination to, you know, make it work or, you know, why are we over-regulating this, you know, when we're looking for opportunities to create new housing, we're looking for creative ways to get, you know, more housing. Let's focus on the site coverage. Let's focus on making sure that we're preserving some of that open space, which is what people are thinking about when they're thinking about larger lot sizes, you know, and preserving larger lot sizes. You're really thinking about preserving natural space and open space. And we're also trying to hit this 40% tree canopy coverage through the city. So um, it just feels to me like we should focus on the things that we're actually trying to do. And, um, you know, and, and then just kind of let, the market work out the details of whether, you know, these, they can fit more units onto a smaller lot in a certain case or not. But really in this zone, we expect 50% site coverage as a max, or we expect 35% site coverage as a max. And, you know, just stay within that target. And, you know, you can put as much as you think works there um, for, you know, what you're trying to do. But, um, you know, it just feels to me like we're we're just still trying to apply a lot of the same techniques of zoning to uh, something that really doesn't need to be this. You know, I, I don't need a 5,000 minimum lot size for a quadplex. That might be what happens anyway because of physics. But, you know, if someone can work it out onto a 4,500 square foot lot, then why not? I really blowing the code up. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right, um, Stefan, and then maybe we can move move on from there. Thanks. Thank you. I agree with Joseph's comment first of all, and in response to Renee's question about uh, what might be built on a three thousand square foot lot, I'd point out uh, I my family lived in a seven hundred and fifty square foot house in Corvallis. Uh, a family of four lived there for 50 years before we moved in there. 
Uh, I have a daughter who lives in an 850 square foot house in Ardenwald, and it's not the smallest house in Ardenwald. Wow. There you go. Okay. Um, and I'm happy to share that I live in a 700 square foot house. So that's, that's what I'm sitting in right now. So there's, yeah. there are housing types that are small. Um, Okay, is there a poll question, Mary, that we want? Oh, sorry, Eugene, and then we can- One practical on. question, and that's, has any dimension been levied about what defines an accessory dwelling unit as to its minimum or maximum size? Our current code has that. Um, the, our current code has an AD, it um, talks about the ADU's relationship to the main house on the property, and it can't be larger than either 800 square feet or 75% of the size of the main house on the property. So it's intended to be smaller. Um, and our code right now does talk about what those sizes are. There's some discussion, been some discussion about that too, um, but that's for another conversation. But yes, an ADU right now is regulated by size in its relationship to the main house. Yep. Okay, Mary, can we have a poll question? about this 3,000 square foot business, sure. just so we kind of know where everyone is, and then we can move on to the next section. All right, the question, do you prefer single dwelling unit? And I think, you know, just sort of right now, we just kind of want to get a, the pulse or sort of temperature of the group to have a lot size of 3,000 square feet or 5,000 square feet. Or if you need more info. Yeah, or if you need more info, yeah but we just kind of want to get a sense of where folks are with this idea of a smaller lot. We can certainly experiment with the complete explosion of the code as Joseph is recommending, um, which is fine. <laughs> but just to kind of see where folks are. I think there's a couple more people. All right. We're good. Yeah. All right, so we've got almost two thirds in the 3000 square foot camp. Got a, some folks that need a bit more information and that's fair. This is sort of a new idea and we know that, mm -hmm. um, but we kind of wanted to just get a sort of a temperature. And so it sounds like we've got you know, some more discussion and some more work to do on this, but this is great. Um, thanks folks, appreciate it. Okay. If we can continue on, um, let's see. Um, we also wanted to talk about the idea of um, housing type. And so I know that we've had a conversation about this and just sort of want to get, um, again, sort of an idea from people about um, this idea of attached and detached um, units for our various middle housing types. Um, House Bill 2001 does not require that we allow attached or detached units. It's something that we've been talking about as um, an idea for flexibility um, for site design. Um, these images are from the model code that was um, created. So just as a way of illustrating the different ways that a duplex could be developed. It could be stacked, it could be side by side, it could be two units um, to separate buildings um, on the same lot and that could be considered a duplex. Um, again, from the model code, they talk about, you know, how might a triplex look? It could be attached or it could be detached in three separate um, units. Um, quadplex, same way. It could be some stacked side-by-side -side units or it could be, you know, four individual structures um, and be a quadplex. Um, so that's sort of the idea, whoops, um, wrong question, um, is sort of the idea of allowing for attached or detached as part of the um, middle housing type. Um, we would still be applying, of course, lot coverage and, um, you know, and setbacks and all of those same things, um, but to provide some flexibility. And we've asked this question in, in surveys. We've asked, you know, this question sort of in some of our breakout groups as well, um, but we wanted to see if we could put a pin in this idea um, with this group so um, we could move ahead with some code language that would reflect um, what folks were thinking about this. And I remind me again, I think we have a poll question about this too, Mary, do we? 
probably should have taken better notes about this. Nope, we, do. we do. We do. Okay. Great. Um, Are there any questions about this idea of yeah. detached or, or attached um, units? Anyone? Okay. So would, it, I guess another way of putting it would be um, a triplex could be three separate units on one lot versus one building with three units. That's the, that's the flexibility of would people um, be flexible with having, with the number of units counting versus what the building looks like. So any questions on that? I have a question on that. Yes. Um, kind of Indicating back to when we were considering the jello mold thing and uh, also talking about how houses would need to have certain features, I guess, to make them look more like houses and not just super cheaply built things. Um, would there be such kind of aesthetic requirements for that? And I'm not talking about sort of like emergency housing type stuff, but for like a, a triplex that's three separate structures um, how is the city thinking about how it would require aesthetic considerations for those? So it sounds like that I think you're like asking about, you're asking about did, sorry, did I hear someone else? Hear okay, it's me. Okay. okay. It's me. Um, um, are you asking are about, you design, about standards design standards for yeah. the structures? Yeah. Yeah. Cause I'm, I'm kind of thinking about like, there's, um, uh, I forget the name of the, area, but it's, I guess what Mark Amos said, it's the similar area with the tallest building in Milwaukee, but you wouldn't know it because it's kind of down a hill, but there's the area where it's like, maybe it was post-World War housing and they're just all very same houses, very small, very kind of like cheaply built. Um, and it doesn't have uh, really a sense of like community and being like a vital space. And I know that multiple houses to constitute a duplex or triplex or quadplex, the, the way that those are built has so much to do with how it functions as people living in spaces. Um, so it's a hard question to answer without having a sense of um, how the city would require them to relate to each other and what kind of space in between them would be kind of promoted or otherwise. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, sort of like community, my, my preference is for community centric design, mm -hmm. uh, just to kind of let you know where I'm coming from. And I think that these kinds of structures can be done really well and they can be done really poorly. Right. Yeah. And I think that's getting think to that's getting design, to standards. design standards. standards. And that's, and that's you know, we have design know. standards now for, you know, single unit homes, for duplexes, we have design standards for townhouses. I mean, there are certain, you know, windows and front doors and certain elements. Um, we don't prescribe design, but we have certain things that, you know, we want folks to have, you know, within a home that still provides design flexibility. Um, so it's a good question. And I think it's something we would want to think about, you know, what would those design standards look like for um, a detached, you know, quadplex or something like that. So no, it's a good point. And I think it's something that we would just kind of want to think about a little bit more. You know, are they different from the ones that we would have for, for single family homes or is, you know, is this idea of this little, of a cluster of multiple dwellings, um, do those have different standards or kind of how we might keep them clear and objective, but still get to the design aesthetic that we're, that we're looking for. It's a good point. Yep. And um, uh, some of this too is, is trying to relate to what's happening on a site as well. So say you have a big mature tree and a single building that's a triplex may not be able to save the tree, but if you could do one duplex and then a back unit, say that's just one unit to uh, create space to save the tree, that could be a reason why it'd be useful to have the flexibility. Um, also, lot coverage would still be the same. So it's not like, I don't think we're, and Vera, correct me, I don't think we're proposing more lot coverage meaning more no. buildings on a lot right. We're not. for this. So it would still be the same amount of building. Yeah. It just would be smaller footprint sizes. That's right. So that's something to consider as well. Yep. Um, and I'm just, before we move on, um, Sharon has a question in the chat, which is a good one. Um, if this idea, you know, do we, do we still need to define ADU 
if, and it, this has been asked before, and this is kind of, we're getting into the weeds where I like to be, but um, I don't want to belabor this point, but Sharon, it's a great question because if a duplex can be two individual units, then well, what's a house and an ADU? Isn't that the same thing? And aren't we really just talking about two units on a lot? And shouldn't that be how we're referring to everything? Why are we calling things a triplex or a quadplex yeah. when it's really just about the number of units? Great question. We've been talking about it a bunch. Um, and part of this next phase of code development is also um, a way of potentially waiting out how things might um, play out as far as what other agencies are calling things. And I don't want to get too technical about it, but in some ways, systems development charges at the county level um, are assessed based on the housing type. And so in some cases, um, if another agency calls something in ADU specifically because of the way they're going to assess fees for it, that, that name or that nomenclature matters. We would really like to kind of strip all of that out and start thinking about just the number of units on a lot, but we may not be able to if there is an extra, we don't want to make things more complicated by making things more simple. So um, we need to make sure that we're consistent in what other agencies call things so that we're not creating a problem for applicants and trying to suss out um, or make determinations about fees. So we kind of, I think it's a great point, you know, do any of these things really matter at some point? And for now, I think they do. But maybe by the time we actually get to code adoption, we may be able to kind of strip out some of this nomenclature and simplify what we're calling things. So that's, we're up against that as well. Mm -hmm. um, Dan, I saw your hand is up. Just wanted to flag one other potential consideration in regards to Sharon's question, which is if to the extent that the scenario is adding a second structure on a lot where there's an existing structure, whether it is an ADU versus a duplex could have very significant implications in terms of the degree to uh, triggering exceptions to Oregon's property tax limitations. And the mm -hmm. State Department of Revenue actually had to conduct rulemaking a few years ago to try to fix the situation of people um, having their entire properties <laughs> reassessed when they added an ADU. So I, I think that just gets into like very sort of practical considerations about the, the financial feasibility of this kind of development and it's, it's worth paying attention to. Yep. Good, yeah, point. good point. Stefan? Yeah, I like, I like Daniel's point. That's a good one. Um, back in the day, Metro would not count ADUs as units. Uh, towards the overall density within the community. I don't know whether that's still true, but it's it's worth uh, tracking that one down. Mm -hmm. Just anyway. Yeah, our code we don't right now, as far as minimum and maximum density ADUs don't count towards that either. So you're right. So there's yeah, words matter in this particular case. What we're calling things for all for a whole host of reasons. So. Um, yeah, that we this may be something that we're sort of tracking as we go continuously until we don't need to, or we kind of we may have to tweak things later um, as well. Um, okay, Matt, one more question, and then um, we're going to need to move on. So we're going to have to, yeah, if we can, Matt, go ahead. Great, thanks. I, I just made a quick comment as well. I think that the ADU scenario at the the multiple units to make up a duplex, triplex, quadplex are functionally different and they both serve uh, kind of unique purposes. And, you know, there may be homeowners who are really open to creating an ADU specifically to address uh, housing crises and they're still maintaining kind of functional control of it. They're still owners of the property that might appeal to more homeowners. Uh, whereas this other scenario is creating kind of more um, housing autonomy and, you know, you might have uh, multi-owner situation, of course, rentals as well, but um, I think they both serve um, kind of unique purposes and alleviate, can be leveraged to alleviate uh, housing crisis from slightly different angles. And so I think it's valuable to think about it that way. Well, thanks. Okay. Um, do we want to hit that poll question about yes. the um, detached and attached, and then we'll move on to flag lots. <clears throat> Okay, 
Um, do you support flexibility to create both attached and detached units for middle housing types? And Vera, maybe why folks are answering the question, mm -hmm. I think uh, Eugene had one question. So maybe Eugene, if you want to ask that question while we're doing the poll, that might be, might be a good time. Okay, thanks. Uh, it seems that we've been talking about the use of mainly uh, private property and residences, but I'm wondering if uh, there's been any attitude or posture taken to express space that is owned by nonprofits, specifically speak, speaking of churches, or large pieces of real estate that businesses own that aren't in use and sit dormant with a lot of square footage. Thank you. I'm just gonna go to this real quick. So it sounds like, so it looks like everyone is supporting attached or detached. So that's, I think that's our first unanimous vote, everyone. All right. Great, we're all on the same page for this one. Terrific, thank you. Um, and thanks Eugene to sort of talk about, you know, other kinds of, you know, institutional uses and that sort of thing. So I think there's, there's a way that we could probably be thinking about other ways to be developing this property. Thank well, you for that. And, um, churches or other like schools, hospitals, those things have a different designation, but they're, a lot of them are technically on residential zones. Yeah. So um, there's maybe some good insight there. Okay, if we could um, like to um, talk about flag lots um, and move on to another topic. And I think we're gonna see if we can talk about this usefully um, in less time than we thought. So let's see if we can do it. Um, okay, I'm bringing up flag lots and, um, and what we mean by flag lot is basically a long skinny lot that has a lot behind it. So it's sort of this rear lot development idea. And the reason I'm bringing, um, we wanted to bring this up is because we allow flag lots now in the city, but there are, a couple of different ways, you know, with this with this new code and sort of the things that we'll be allowing that will have different ways of development on a long skinny lot. So we, um, you know, we could have a long skinny lot that has multiple units on it, sort of all on the same lot, sort of what we've been talking about right now, right? A quadplex that has multiple units and it's all under the same ownership. It's all under one lot. There aren't separate lots for each of the dwelling units or as we see here sort of outlined in blue, we have this idea of an actual separate property that is behind um, an existing house. So it's on its own lot. And this is what, we're call what I'm referring to as a flag lot. Um, and we have flag lot standards now in the city. Um, and we've got some key questions or some questions that we wanna ask about how flag lots happen here in the city versus this idea of multiple units on the same lot that they aren't divided. Um, so we've got some examples sort of of how a flag lot works. You know, there's the pole, there's the flag itself. Um, and that's sort of this, what we were just showing in that other um, image. This is the flag lot. This is the parent lot or sort of the house that was always there. Um, on this map um, of the city, and this is a very unscientific map. This was me just sort of looking <laughs> at, um, at a map. And, um, but there are, there are a lot of flag lot opportunities. Again, these long skinny lots. Um, a lot of them are in these older subdivisions that were in Ardenwald. And so they were built this way. They're about 72 feet wide um, and 200 feet deep. So again, a long skinny lot, big backyards basically. And the idea is sort of how, how do we, is there a way to kind of create some more development potential, um, you know, on these lots. Um, again, right now the code does allow for flag lots. So this idea of this flag with a pole um, with a house behind a house. Um, very basically there's been, we've had flag lot standards in our code um, since almost, well, since 1979. Um, and we've gone back and forth in the code for making flag lots easy to create um, or more difficult to create. Um, we've wanted to promote infill development. And then there was, you know, back in the late 90s, um, 
there was some growing dissatisfaction in the neighborhoods about having multiple flag lots on the same on the same um, in the same neighborhood or on the same street. Um, and then the latest iteration of our code is what we have now since 2002, where we've got you know the flagpole has to be 25 feet wide. We don't allow variances, you know, to create the flag lot to be able to create this land division. We've increased the setbacks on the flag lot. We have a maximum of two flag lots. We've got screening and planting requirements. So we've made it um, difficult to create flag lots. Um, and on a lot of these lots that I've identified here, most of these cannot have a flag lot on it because of the width of the pole requirement. Um, we'd end up with a whole suite of variances that would be necessary to be able to subdivide those, um, those lots to be able to create this opportunity for a lot in the back. And so the question that we're, we were hoping to get to with this group um, is this idea of um, potentially um, thinking about reducing the standards to create a flag lot in some instances. We've asked this question um, at the City Council and the Planning Commission, and now it's your turn to weigh in um, on this idea of, um, you know, you can see here, um, here in Ardenwald, there are some streets that have multiple flag lots of varying widths in that flagpole. Um, and again, that's sort of part of that history of allowing variances for that pole width or different widths of the pole. Um, and here's an example of what they allow in the county, which are just rear lots with no pole at all. And there's an access via an easement across the front lot. So this is another way of thinking about this rear lot development. And part of this question is this idea of a long skinny lot being developed with multiple units or providing the opportunity to actually divide it um, so that whoever owns the lot still keeps their front house and then they sub subdivide it out and some and development happens behind them. And what was coming out of some of our other discussions, you know, with city council and planning commission was this idea of potentially reducing the standards for a flag lot if it was for middle housing. Is this an opportunity to incentivize middle housing um, on some of these rear lots to be able to capture some of this real estate in the backyards, um, but create opportunities um, for home ownership potentially or land ownership um, for middle housing? So the question, and I hope I've done an okay job of explaining the problem, or I guess the challenge or the question that we're trying to ask, and what is a flag lot and what are we looking to do? Um, but the idea of, you know, is there any appetite for relaxing some of these standards um, for middle housing? And these are some examples. This is a picture of a flag lot um, development in, um, in the county and Cher well, it's in the city now, but it was built under county standards at Cherigino Farms. That was, you know, these developments here. Um, so this is the front lot, and then this is the house behind it on the flag lot. This is a picture of a flag lot development here in the city. Um, this is, I think, the most recently developed. Um, I think this was built two years ago. So this is the front lot, um, and then this is the flag lot in the back with a shared driveway um, is how those got built. Um, so that's our key question. Um, I know I did that kind of quickly, so I'm happy to answer any clarifying questions um, that folks have. But again, it's this idea of how do we, how how do we deal with um, flag lots and middle develop middle housing? Is there any appetite to do anything differently than we do now? I think stop sharing. Stefan has. Great. I saw his hand first, and then Renee, and then Micah. Stefan? So um, to the question, uh, I, I don't think we should reduce the, the method of uh, calculating the area of the lot, given that we're talking about reducing lot sizes in general. It seems like we're addressing that in another way, and I don't mm -hmm. think we need to do both. I do think there's um, some potential for shared access flag lots on two adjoining lots. We haven't really talked about that. But other than that, I think the other provisions are okay. Um, I, there are, you know, there are good things and bad things about flag lots, but I certainly know people who love living on them. That's my pitch. I think Renee was next. 
could you go back to the slide with the photos? Because I, I'm not seeing visually what the what the first one's illustrating. Do you mean these photos, Renee? Yeah. So the one in the top left, this what one. is that illustrating? I wanted from the street, this is what a flag lot development looks like. If you were walking on the street, this is the front house and then there's a house behind it. So it was just a, it was just a way of showing what a flag lot development would look like from the street. But, but it was given as an example of an alternative to having an actual flag lot, having an actual pole. Correct. So from the street, it doesn't look any different. But as a development, it makes a difference if you don't have to have the pole here. This, it, from the street, it looks virtually the same because there's still a driveway accessing the lot in the back. But you don't have to have your actual property go down to the front. So that makes a difference for an existing development um, if you don't have to create a new property line. You're just, you just have a lot in the back. So it's not actually a separate property. It is a separate property, but the access is not on your property. You have an easement across I the front. I see. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. All right. So my, um, once again, it's more of a comment and maybe a concern based on your map. I know you said it was a, a, a quick one with mm -hmm. all the pink lots in Ardenwald. Mm-hmm. Um, you're talking about specific individual lots, but you're also talking about a neighborhood mm -hmm. with lot after lot after lot right next to each other that will have whatever the decision is, it will affect in a multitude in one specific area. And I don't have any uh, solid numbers, but it looks like about 175 lots are in pink on that map. And as far as I know, there's about uh, 1,200 uh, units in Ardenwald. So that's a large percentage of Ardenwald that will be affected by whatever is decided. I, I think that needs to be taken into consideration. Sure. Uh, and you're right. And I think you know, and the reason why we wanted to talk about this is because any one of these long skinny lots could be developed anyway, you know, in, in the back. I, the, the specific question is, you know, would we allow for an actual land division to be able to build in the back? But they could be developed now. Any one of these properties could choose um, to build additional units in their backyard, you know, but just not on a separate lot. So that's kind of, um, I don't mean to get so surgical about it. And you're right, certainly these lots were platted very specifically many, many, many years ago originally to be long and skinny. Um, and I think someone had called these victory garden lots because they had such a big backyard, you know, for, for that sort of thing. So you're absolutely right. You know, this flag lot development, you know, would affect, um, you know, would affect these lots pretty specifically, of course. Um, I think I just don't wanna leave, have folks leave you know, the meeting thinking that if we make these changes in flag lots, that's why they can be developed. But under the code, you know, they, they could develop you know, with multiple lots anyway, you know, as a condominium or rental units too. But you're right, Ardenwald has um, a preponderance of these long skinny lots for sure. I just wanna point out these flag lots are not in Ardenwald. Um, these are actually in the Llewellyn neighborhood. So flag lot development opportunities do exist throughout the city, but there's a lot of them in Ardenwald. You're absolutely right. Yep. And we did have a, a question from Sharon in the comments. Um, if decreasing pole width requirements, uh, how do we assure fire emergency access? It's a great question. They would still have to meet fire access requirements. So we wouldn't be reducing them to the point that a fire truck wouldn't be able to get back there. Um, so it would, um, we would, we would, if we were to reduce them, we would still be double checking against the fire requirements. So even though it looks like a couple, I think, you know, this one's only eight feet wide. So I'm not really yeah. sure how that works, but 
I didn't approve that one. That was before me. So I don't know. <laughs> and then I think Micah is next. Okay. Yeah. Um, one concern I have about um, increasing flag lots is the increased amount of um, impervious surface or paved Mm -hmm. of space. And so I'm wondering if flat, if we can reduce the, um, the on street or off street parking requirements for them and or use the the pole as on and off street parking. Mm -hmm. Good questions. Yeah. And Sharon also, I didn't see the second one. Sharon also had a similar question of asking if there's opportunities for alley type access or easement mm -hmm. this. I think alley access is always a great idea if we can make that work too. So good point, Sharon. Okay. But yeah, currently um, our code does, doesn't require, but it encourages shared to convert the driveways like to be a shared driveway. Yeah. And that's something that we could also um, consider either making or a requirement or keeping it as a recommendation to reduce the number of driveways mm -hmm. on the street. So then the parent lot doesn't have their own driveway and then the flag lot has their own driveway. That'd be two on the very close together. So that kind of hinders pedestrian and bicycle safety as well. So yeah, our, like, our code requires that basic, unless there would have to be a really good reason to not combine those accesses. The idea is that it is, that those driveways are shared. Yep. Okay. And I think part of this too is trying to get at the providing more home ownership options. Um, it's harder to do that except in condominium if they're all, if multiple buildings are on the same lot. So there were some uh, questions from the community and, and CPIC members of wanting to also make sure we're creating ways for home ownership, which a lot of times nowadays with our financial structure is you kind of have to be on your own lot. I think, I think we have a poll question about yes. this too. So again, trying to get a sense of the temperature of the group, um, if we should be exploring some alternatives to our flag lot development standards um, for middle housing. So do folks support relaxing the flag lot standards for middle housing? Um, and again, so the idea here is that, you know, what we were generally thinking is that we would leave our flag lot standards the way they are if you were building a single unit home, for example. Um, but if we want to incentivize middle housing, you know, maybe we think about relaxing some of the standards. But to Stefan's point, you know, which ones those are um, is still something to think about, but it's an approach or a direction that we are hoping to get from people. That looks like, so some folks still need some more information. So. And for the folks that need more information, um, if it's something that are specific questions or kind of a bullet point things or, you know, what would you like to know more about? Um, maybe you could put that in the chat because um, these are things that we can be using as a way of figuring out um, what, do, what should we be addressing or thinking about as we create the code. So if, um, if you wouldn't mind typing that into the chat, that would be great. Okay, so it looks like we're at 67%. So we do have a majority, but um, if there's some, what other information should we be thinking about um, or considering um, as we look at these standards? Because again, we allow flag lots now. So it's kind of a matter of, you know, are there some tweaks to be made or not um, as we work through this? Okay. Thanks for that. All right. So we are on to, if you can believe it, it's 746 right now, guys. We have blown through almost two hours of this meeting on all these cool topics. This is great. Um, 
Okay, we wanted to take some time to talk about next steps and what's coming up. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and we're gonna move over and have Laura kind of take over this portion of the presentation. Laura, over to you. All right, thanks, Sarah. So if you can forward the slide, I don't think I can do it. Ah, there you go. Uh, we were joking earlier that this is our circus slide because it's got so many crazy colors and we had a lot of fun with this slide. So I know there's a lot to digest right here. So I apologize for that, but we tried to color code the different things that are coming by their characteristics, right? So um, alluding to what uh, Vera was talking about, just um, where we are in the process and then what does the rest of this process look like? So as, as you know, we're getting to this draft code in June. And so that's when we're at the end of our DLCD grant for the compliance with House Bill 2001. But obviously we're doing a lot more than what's uh, required through 2000, uh, House Bill 2001. So we have first, before I go through this whole process, we have a request for CPIC. Um, we do have some more topics that, again, like Vera said, that are not House Bill 2001 issues, but that we still want to get your guidance and feedback on, much like we've done with all of these other topics, uh, just like we've been doing tonight. And so we are hoping that we could ask you all, you don't have to answer right this moment, um, I'll take a little poll uh, at the end, whether you would be willing to spend uh, one more um, Oh wait, sorry. June, sorry, Vera. June is the June is the meeting we already have scheduled. Whoops. Okay, June's already scheduled. I'm looking over into July. So what we're hoping is that in July we could have another meeting with you folks to get some feedback on some of these outstanding uh, questions that we have. In particular, one of them was brought up tonight, which was great, was which we want to talk about cottage clusters. That's something that we want to talk about with you all. Um, we also want to talk a little bit about townhomes. And we want to talk about this concept of floor area ratio, which is kind of looking at the uh, jello mold a little bit differently. And so we're hoping that we can spend another meeting with you in July. Um, and so we're also in July going to start basically taking all of these um, concepts. And we've already started doing this, as Vera talked about, by going to planning commission and city council and talk about some of these ideas. So we're going to start having a series of work sessions with planning commission starting in July. And I think we have three or four on the schedule. So that's where we can kind of go through and get into the nitty gritty of all of these things with them as well. Um, and then we would have hearings with the planning commission in October or November. And then we would go and have um, a couple of study sessions with city council, and then we would also have public hearings with city council in December. So that's all the way through the end of the year. And kind of throughout this process, um, we would be tracking all of the public comment that we get um, at the work sessions and or that we also get um, through our online engagement that we're going to be doing. We're going to kind of be talking, um, talking to folks through the Engage Milwaukee platform, just letting people know what is coming before Planning Commission and how they can get involved and where they can leave comments. And we're really um, doing this and having this Planning Commission time be kind of spread out and long because we understand from everybody and as we said before this is a really complicated uh, process and we're doing something really big to the code that we haven't done in a we've, well we've never really done this much to the code at one time and so we want to be able to give everybody time and the community time to digest everything that's going on and be able to give some feedback um, to share with planning commission and then ultimately city council so we've really kind of spread out the adoption process in hopes that we can continue to engage people and continue to educate people about all of these ideas and then um, loop that feedback in through the planning commission. So we've kind of spread it out uh, through the rest of the year. Um, so we'll also be, in, in addition to Engage Milwaukee, we'll be doing you know, pilot articles and social media, and we'll be going to NDA meetings. And again, if anyone on this committee ever wants um, us to come and talk to anybody about this, we would love to have that opportunity to do that. 
So this is kind of just the outline of uh, where the next steps are. And the idea is that we have our meeting with you all in June where we're gonna have some draft code for you all. And then we're hoping that we can get another meeting with you in July. And then that part, the CPIC meetings will come to an end. And then um, we will continue to take it through the rest of the process, but we would encourage CPIC members, of course, to continue to talk to your neighbors about it, continue to ask questions, um, come to the uh, public hearings and provide your feedback, come to the city council uh, hearings as well, provide your feedback. Um, so I guess what I'm gonna stop right here and ask if anyone has any questions about how this is going to go through uh, the process through the rest of the year. All right, I'm not seeing any questions. I'm just gonna wait for a second in case anybody has any. Not, not. Hi, yeah, uh, seeing that the, the role or job of this committee will be concluding with sort of like the forming of the code, but the process moves on. I appreciate the invitation to participate. I don't know if anybody else has a feeling that like we're kind of getting off the train a little early or what, but I'm, I'm curious like what, what feels like a sort of satisfactory endpoint for everybody else, is there an option to keep it more formal? I, I think we would see some pretty major disbanding if it were just sort of like an optional thing. And I really value the input of everybody on this committee. Well, I'm hoping that everybody will can um, come in June and July and if anybody wanted to talk more about um, Matt's idea, um, we could talk about that. Just as a caveat, we, we, have a, we've, we have to get to a certain point with the planning commission so that they can actually look at the code that's being written. And so that there has to be the kind of a point where the CPIC work ends and you guys have been so critical to, so thus far to all of the work that's been done by providing all of this guidance. I mean, everything that we have done thus far has been guided by these meetings. And that's why we're hoping to get to go through to July to continue guiding um, the things that are coming, we still have yet to discuss. And so then it starts to become a, um, the planning commission's role to kind of get into the technical details, even even more so than this committee probably has um, and get to a point where they can get through it all and then get it off to city council to go through the hearing process. All right, so um, I guess on that is, are folks willing to meet again in July? I'm seeing, I'm seeing shaking of heads for the most part. Okay, that would be awesome. We think we really appreciate the extra time. Um, we've got some, still got some really good stuff to dig into for July meeting. So I'm looking forward to that. And, and like I said, I really do um, encourage you all to um, continue talking to your neighbors. And if anything comes up and you have any more questions, you have any more feedback you wanna provide us, Vera is always here. I'm always here. Mary's always here. We always want to hear from people. That is one of the, the things that we like most is hearing from people and hearing people's ideas. And we will continue to listen to anything, any of those ideas you might have and continue to kind of track all of that, all ideas as it moves through the process so we can continue to share those ideas with the planning commission as they're working through the work sessions and getting to public hearing. All right. If, with, if I could, Laura, yeah, sorry, I just I just wanted to add because part of, um, you know, and and I think this, you know, sort of when this project started and when we thought it was going to end has obviously shifted quite a bit. You know, we weren't originally imagining the code adoption process going, you know, through December. Um, that was something that, you know, as we've been working through all of these issues, you know, with with you folks and all of the stuff we've been working on behind the scenes, it became very clear that, you know, sort of that June 
you know, idea um, of the grant and kind of making all that work was it shifted from an end to a milestone and then having this next phase of work happening. Um, so it, and we did, you know, we have gotten feedback and I know, you know, Ronell's letter includes, you know, some of those thoughts about, you know, things happening too fast, too big, too much, you know, too quickly, that kind of thing. And so, um, you know, we heard all of that stuff and also understood from our own, you know, to, to do this right, you know, was going to take more time. Um, so I just wanted to kind of reiterate that, you know, feedback and comments that we get from everybody, you know, we hear all of that stuff and we've, um, and we've, it makes a lot of sense, we think to do this right and to take, you know, more time kind of in this next round of, of code adoption. So as, as Laura was mentioning um, in June, you know, will be kind of that draft code that is the House Bill 2001 compliant piece, the part that's going to go to DLCD. It's sort of this baseline of code, um, but we want to talk about Florida area ratio and FAR as a way of um, finessing the code that we will have. Um, FAR is not something that House Bill 2001 requires or as a way of thinking about lot coverage and those kinds of things, but it's a way that we would like to explore with this group. And then the July meeting talking about cottage clusters and, and townhouse, townhome, you know, design and design standards. That's something we haven't talked about as a group. And again, those are the sorts of things that we, that will help our code be, um, to use an overly used term, you know, context sensitive for what we're gonna have here um, in Milwaukee. So really appreciate um, folks being willing to spend a little more time with your, in your summer um, with us to kind of, to get these design standards and get these standards um, good, you know, for us, for what Milwaukee wants. So I just kind of wanted to put that back. And, you know, you, you folks see us once a month, you know, we're thinking about this all the time. And so we just kind of wanted to share with you that we, you know, this, this is a really big laboratory experiment that all cities and towns in, in Oregon are in with the state. And we're kind of all working through this experiment and um, it's, um, it's exciting, but it's a lot. And so thanks, you know, I'm just going to thank you in advance for what you're about to help us with as we go forward. So thank you for that. Councilor Beatty. Can I ask, um, I will say after six years on council and before that nine years on planning commission, I still have a problem understanding floor area ratio. Um, so if you guys find any good like videos that kind of, talk through it or something that we can see, kind of look at ahead of that discussion, I think it might be helpful. That's a great call because yes, it's a really complicated and not easy, easy to explain or easy to understand. And so, yeah, we'll try to find something hopefully that might be able to get it all in our brains. The magic, the magic thing that explains it to everybody. Um, Renee, you had your hand up. Yeah, I just wondered, is there going to be some kind of final um, report of such sorts from the consultants? And will we have a chance to see that and comment on it and or evaluate um, our experiences with them or with their work or our impressions? The synthesis report, Vera, I believe we'll have at the next meeting. Is that correct? Well, it's a synthesis report, but it's really the code, sort of the, yeah. you know, the code itself. Um, there will be um, sort of an overall um, report from the um, public engagement consultants, sort of as an overall summary of all of the things that, you know, that we've done. But as far as, you know, there are, you know, I don't, I think there will be some kind of a final synthesis report, but it's really about the code itself that's going, you know, that it's being prepared for DLCD and then sort of the next round um, of additional work that they're going to do with us sort of after that milestone date and when their contract ends. Um, but if there is, um, I mean, the whole, the end product of this project is code language. It's not really a report, um, it's code. Um, but certainly if they're, um, you know, and I can sort of, um, I can check in with Marcy and her team about sort of what will be the deliverable um, for the next CPIC meeting, but I think it's more about code and not, an act, and not really a report. Um, but if there, 
is something that you know you want to share with us you know as far as it sounds like sort of an evaluation or or you know your experience you know with them it sounds like there you have things to share and that's great and we'd be happy to hear it um so if that's something you want to you know you want to share with us we can we, we would gratefully accept that of course um, it's also pretty common vera um at the end of committees, we can provide an evaluation card sure. that people can fill out, either mm -hmm. anonymously, anonymously or not, whatever yep. you're comfortable Absolutely. with. And it would have different, you know, questions. And then obviously you can add on to anything. But um, I think we did that for the comprehensive plan, maybe, or maybe it was a vision committee. I don't remember, or okay. both. I don't know. Um, but yes, we can do that. So if I understood correctly from the, the very beginning, uh, you, uh, sounds like you're reevaluating after this portion is done, the grant portion, whether their work will be extended or not. Did I understand that correctly? No, they, they have a contract with us that has a scope of work. Um, this milestone is part of it, but there is there will still be some budget left for additional work post that to get us into sort of this next round of what will our final code be. So there's a milestone draft code, that's the DLCD piece, and then there's the Milwaukee code, I'll call it, that comes after that. And there is still some, and there is still some work that they can help us with, you know, in that following round, but they aren't with us the whole way. At some point they leave and city staff takes it from there. But they'll help um, us the like final through code. the planning commission work sessions, like when planning commission gives us gives feedback, then we can go in and work with a consultant to tweak it. And so through all of those planning, those work sessions, we'll get feedback that the consultant will still need to be on board to help us make those changes that as we hear feedback. Yep. There's a couple questions in the in the chat, um, Matt, regarding the um, will CPIC have years more work to do as other sections go so um, come up. Um, so the this committee was put together specifically for this project, housing trees and parking. Um, but the CPIC, the CPIC name implies that it's all about implementation of the comp plan. So I think our um, and we're still, I think, still figuring out how that's going to work, but we can imagine, you know, some version of this committee or this committee kind of working through all of the sections of the code, but folks may drop off if it's not, you know, a topic that they're interested in and come back in. So as a committee sort of generically, it will exist, but the membership may change based on the topic of whatever the next um, phase of implementation is um, for the comp plan. So I don't know if that answers your question, but yes, this com a committee called CPIC is gonna keep working, but the topic and the membership will may change. Matt, we'll be reaching out to you since, uh, you know, totally. we may, we'll ask if you want us to be on the next, the next version, okay. the next iteration. We'll actually ask all of you if you want to yeah. be on the next iteration of this. I think what will come after this is the neighborhood hubs and also the transportation system plan. Yeah. So we'll have a couple of other things going as soon as we wrap this up. Wrap this up. Yeah, yeah y'all can hang out with us for the next eight, eight years if you want. I mean, yeah. <laughs> those of us that carried over from CPAC, like we did, we have the I think this <clears throat> kind of came up and we had some little bit of edge bumping about this because we were not expecting it to be so focused on these three things. Uh, specifically, I'm kind of recalling the outreach that was done for the CPIC and it seemed like it would be a continuation of kind of a comprehensive arc specifically about implementation. And so um, I would I would certainly be in support of continuing and I think continuity is really important in this kind of work. Certainly having new members, some changeovers is helpful, but um, you know, like uh, Councilor Bailey was saying, with um, about 15 years of experience working with the city, uh, it's still hard to grasp some of these things. <laughs> so continuity is very valuable. Um, and I see, um, a and comment, I see a comment in the chat the from chat Councilor from Beatty about meeting in person in July. Um, so I, as city staff, I look to the city manager to tell me how we're doing things like that. So um, about meeting in person, um, and that's certainly something that we can ask, you know, the group about um, how that works. I've just I am unaware of the city policy for in person meetings yet. So um, speaking for myself, um, I would be 
more than thrilled to be able to meet in person um, finally, but um, I, I have to go by sort of what our city policy is going to be for in-person meetings and, and that sort of thing and, and how we're approaching that with our committees. So um, that's something we, you know, when we get to that point, you know, we can certainly approach that with the group and see where we are in July. I'd love to think that we're prepared for in-person meetings by July, but I need someone else to tell me that that we're allowed to do that, but thank you for suggesting it. So, yeah. All right, um, so we did set aside some time uh, this go around just to have an open discussion. If there were any outstanding questions or comments or questions, just anything you wanted to talk about about the process, um, just allowing for that time. So we've got a few minutes. If there, anybody's got any outstanding questions for tonight or about the process overall or anything basically that you want to know within you know the confines of this project because i thought <laughs> that i can i don't know yeah and if there are topics you want to revisit you know or talk about more you know um let, let's let's do it for sure stefan and you're muted sorry thank you after yeah. uh, after reading ronell's letter and I think she raised a number of good points, but uh, I noticed that as critical as she was of this process and this group, she offered no suggestions about how we might better address affordable housing. Um, and so I'll toss that out there. If she has some ideas, I think it'd be great if we could hear them. I didn't see if Joseph or Renee's hands went up first. So, okay, and you're both, okay. You can't both go at the same time. I'm gonna choose, Renee, please go and then All Joseph, right. okay. I, I feel <laughs> like, I personally don't feel like there was much discussion about, I guess what you're calling R2. Um, I'm not familiar with those zones and I haven't done my homework to go and like put in you know, go down and walk around and figure out what, where they are and what they are. But I, I don't feel like we talked about those at all. And they didn't, it didn't come up in tonight's meeting about how we're feeling about those two zones. And so I'm just wondering if that's like, uh, just moving forward, or is that on a future meeting about R2? When you're saying so, um, so R2, is the consolidation of our R5, R7, and R10 zones. So those are our, do I'm you mean R1? You mean R1, I mean right? R1. The higher, yeah, Thank so, you. right. So what are currently our higher density zones? Um, so those are the ones that don't cover as much territory um, in the city. Um, and that's where we have, you know, what are our um, larger multifamily developments. So sort of the, the key differences between you know those zones and the rest of the city um, are those are where our you know higher the multifamily apartment developments are are allowed that that would stay you know we wouldn't be changing that certainly the you know duplex triplex and all of those sorts of things would still be permitted there because single family homes or single unit homes are still permitted in our high density higher density zones so that that would stay the same um, the I think we've been concentrating on the other zones because that's the bulk of the territory of the city. That's where the most change would be happening because th those are our, effectively our single family zones. So if we're gonna be introducing new housing types, that's where that's gonna happen. Um, those high, the R1 or the zones that you're talking about also permit some limited number of commercial uses. So those would still be carrying over offices are permitted as conditional uses in those zones. So um, to the extent that there will not be as much change in those zones as there are in the others. And that's why we've concentrated on those. But we can certainly, um, you know, in at the June meeting, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll have obviously those code sections will be written and we can spend some time talking about what will be happening there. Um, but we've been focusing our discussion on the rest of it because that's where folks will be seeing and feeling the most change, you know, over time. And that's where the code is changing more dramatically. 
so that's why we focus there. But it's a good point, and we can my, we can. My question that. is is more along the lines of the consol consolidating all those different zones mm -hmm. into one zone. Right. So you know, because I don't have a, a a background, I don't like my first question is well, why were those? Why were there different zones? Some there's no reason to reinvent the wheel if they came about because of some reason then if those reasons are no longer there then okay but if those reasons are still there and we're consolidating them what's being what's being lost or overlooked i, I guess that's what my mm -hmm. uh, question has to do with okay we will make a point of covering of spending some time at the june meeting talking about that for sure Joseph? Yeah, so um, I am curious about, um, you know, it, it's, it seems within the context of this project uh, to a certain degree, um, because the, you know, we're dealing with trees um, as part of this. Um, and so we're, we're trying to get to the citywide 40% tree canopy coverage. And um, I'm just wondering, because different land uses, different zones um, necessarily result in more or less opportunities for tree canopy coverage or, or even, you know, um, available, you know, site um, coverage opportunities for natural surf surfaces or, you know, whatever. Um, wh where is the 40% coming from? Because, um, you know, in our downtown mixed use zone, obviously we're not going to be getting 40% tree canopy coverage from any of those lots. And so that would necessarily mean that lots in other zones would need to be at greater than 40% coverage in order for the city's average to eventually be 40% citywide. So I'd like to know what percentage of uh, tree cover of canopy coverage is expected to come from um, these, you know, low density residential zones or the, the meet, you know, the the R1 and R2 that we were showing, you know, so there's the higher density, which obviously would be less, the lower density, which would be more. Um, and then obviously there's other zones, you know, throughout the city that I know we're not dealing with the non-residential zones, you know, in this particular project, but we still need to be thinking about in terms of, you know, tree canopy coverage, where is that coming from? What zones are contributing more or less tree canopy coverage? And then does the code that we're actually designing help support that goal? Are um, our site coverage you know, standards um, good enough to result in a greater than 40% tree canopy coverage in the R zones so that they can make up for the downtown zones and you know, other zones where there's going to be more hardscape and less canopy coverage. So I'm, I'm really interested in knowing the math behind how we get to 40%. And, um, and literally what percentages of what zones need to contribute what percentage of canopy in order for us to actually reach that goal. I will talk to Peter about getting that information as well. Okay. Dan? Um, just want to note an additional item for potential review as part of the review of design standards that you mentioned for townhomes and cottage clusters, which is, I don't know enough about the existing design standards to know whether this is actually a concern, but the combination of allowing off street parking in the setback and allowing smaller lots that might be skinny lots, I think could have the out the kinds of outcomes that caused a lot of concern, you know, 20 years ago in Portland about snout houses or having houses that are dominated by a garage or or a driveway in the front. So I would just really recommend that there also be a review of standards related to the front of buildings, particularly with those changes potentially in the works. No, it's a good question. Um, 
I, and, you know, and related to kind of how we're thinking about these new lot sizes or lot configurations, it's a good point to just kind of double check. We have design standards now um, for certainly for a single unit homes um, and for duplexes as far as how um, about snout houses and, and garages. Um, our current standards do not allow a garage to um, expand, extend more than five feet in front of the main wall of the house. And that's only if there's a front porch. <laughs> so we don't allow a garage to be in front of the, in front of the house like that. Um, but it's a good reminder to make sure that, you know, with these other housing types that we're sort of carrying that um, forward to make sure that we don't inadvertently end up in that exact same situation. So it's a it's a good reminder. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. But yeah, that was something that our residential design standards and I'm I have a feeling I think Councillor Beatty, you probably worked on that as part of, when you're on the planning commission. So um I wasn't here for that, but that was um and that's one of the um design standards that I occasionally have to remind builders and designers of even now. And I had I actually had someone have to redesign their house two weeks ago because they didn't comply with that section because they were off by a foot and that a foot matters. So yeah, so it's still, it's something that we definitely remind people of continuously that as well as the width of the garage relative to the width of the house. That's another piece of our um, design standards that um, doesn't, um, doesn't always factor in when folks are thinking about their house designs. Um, it's something actually that um, if anyone travels down Lake Road to the new Cherigino Farms development that was permitted in the county, um, that is not a design standard that the county carries forward. They don't care how wide the garage is <laughs> relative to the width of the house. Um, so that's why there are a lot of three car garages there. Um, but that was something that the, the county allows. And so that's why they are there. But, um, but the garage in particular and the amount of um, windows, the, the relative, that transparency, those percentages um, are pretty key things that we have trouble sometimes with, with some of the designs that are submitted to us even now. So it's a, it's a good reminder with these other housing types that we, that we talk about. Thanks, Dan. Appreciate that. Do we ever get houses submitted that don't have garages at all? New we concerns? have had a couple, we but have. very few. I mean, because we don't require a garage, right? No. Mm -mm. And I think this idea of this 3,000 square foot lot, they're never going to be able, I mean, well, I guess it depends on the layout of the lot, but it's going to be rare that they're going to be able to build a garage and meet that 50, less than 50% standard of the front of the house. Yeah, we do allow for um, a at least a 12 foot wide garage door. No matter how wide your house is, you do get a 12 foot wide garage door. Um, so we do have sort of, you do get that, um, but that would be it. So there could be on occasion, you could, you you may get a garage that is 50% of the width if it is a skin, you know, truly a skinny house and it's a 12 foot wide garage door, but um, but that's the only kind of giveaway that we have in our, in is, our standards. Is there a minimum lot width that currently exists or that is contemplated under mm. the these draft standards? We we have lot minimum lot width standards now. Um, and the lot width is measured where the house starts. So if you, you know, there you could have a, and the reason that is is because you could have sort of a pie shaped <laughs> lot. So it's sort of measured at where the house is. Um, but we don't have, we haven't worked through as yet, I'll be talking to Marcy about kind of how those standards reflect now with, you know, with this new set of code, but with these, with the lots, but um, our minimum lot widths are typically um, 50 and 60 feet. So with these, you know, with this 3000 square foot lot um, that will, we'll have to get obviously would, would likely be narrowed. Um, so we'll have to talk to, talk to Marcy about that, about what that standard is. You know, we've yeah. talked for years about in different contexts about, you know, reducing parking standards and, you know, that people are going to, you know, give up their cars and go to transit and bikes and all of that. But the fact that so few houses are being built without garages tells me we're not, you know, we're not close to that yet. I mean, there'd be a lot more houses being built without garages if people thought that was the, yeah. Anyway, I think that's interesting. 
Well, I mean, we're also not getting any affordable houses built. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, um, Councilor Beatty, to your point about the garages, I mean, we still, the way our code is written, you have to have an off street parking space outside the front yard setback. So if you don't have a garage, then your parking space is to the side of your house. But there's still that, I mean, that space still has to be there, whether or not it's in a garage or a carport or, you know, or something. So, um, so they may not have a physical garage, but there's something, you know, because you have to have that parking space. So, yeah. It'll be interesting to see how, how eliminating that requirement, allowing mm -hmm. the, you know, the, the driveway parking to how, how that affects the number of houses built without garages. Yeah. I'll be interested to see how many existing houses convert their garages to living space mm -hmm. now that they can, you mm -hmm. know, so there's going to be a spreadsheet that's going to be tracking all of this stuff <laughs> we get to see. Stefan? Thank you. Um, this may seem like a digression from the discussion tonight, but it, it may be something of value as we go forward. Um, I've struggled through all the conversations about on-street parking meeting requirements because the nature of the streets are so different from one to the next. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that occurred to me is maybe we could address that in the future with an overlay zone that would apply to those residential lots uh, where there is no opportunity for on-street parking. Uh, Renee's situation or uh, any arterial street really in town, or maybe there's an environmental reason why there's no opportunity. Um, anyway, that, that, so, they're, so that we're not just lumping all these things together, assuming that there will be on-street parking. No, I think, um, and one of the, I think that's a way of getting there. I, I think when we were contemplating this idea of allowing on street, it would be, you know, in certain, it would be context sensitive. So somehow figuring out, well, if, if we are counting on street parking, it has to meet X, Y, Z criteria, clear and objective standards, you know, that there's, so that it isn't, that it, it couldn't be a one size fits all you know, yeah. for the very, for the is exactly those reasons that you're suggesting that there are places that you can't build your way into those on street parking spaces because they just can't be there. Um, so yeah, I, you're right. There are, there will certainly be areas that won't be able to do that. Thank but yeah, you. yep. No, it's a great point. But when, can I ask when you're suggesting an overlay zone, do you mean an overlay for those those zones with the arterial streets and what would that overlay zone be exactly? I'm just, I'm just trying to get a sense of what that, and what that, that might would complicate be like. it unnecessarily. If, okay. if in fact it's incorporated in standards as you described, I think that gets there just as well. Okay. Okay. I mean, who doesn't love an overlay zone, but I mean, but if there might be a way to get there through a standard instead. Okay. Yeah. Renee, it's your hands uh, up. Just back to what uh, Stefan said, um, the consultant who did the parking report did say he was gonna take up on, I think it was Stefan's um, suggestion of a footnote basically to that effect that there were areas that had to be exceptions and in the in our packet for this month, I know it's not, you know, a, a final report or anything, but it, once again, it doesn't, it doesn't even have any wording that leaves that as a possibility that there are some scenarios that won't fit that re recommended uh, code change. So I, I think it needs to s keep coming to the surface somehow or another to address. If I could, so we haven't made a recommendation for on-street parking as yet. It's something that we want to work through. The The recommendation specifically, as we discussed them tonight, was um, making sure that our table and our code is one parking space per dwelling unit, because we need to do that for the house bill compliance. And then the question was to be able to use the driveway or the front yard setback 
as your on-street parking space. We're acknowledging that in the survey and generally in CPIC, it seems like there is some appetite for allowing for some on-street parking to count, but it, you know, to, I, and I'm sorry if we sort of gave the impression that that was a recommendation. We don't know what that is yet. There seems to be some direction that that kind of flexibility should be explored, but it's gonna be under very specific circumstances. So we would certainly, I certainly would not support a recommendation that would allow on-street parking spaces to count for a, for a property that doesn't allow for on-street parking because they're on an arterial. That doesn't make sense. So I think, so to your point, Renee, I think we're not making that recommendation. I think it would be under specific circumstances that an on-street space would count. Um, is it to save a tree? Is it to allow, you know, there, I think we would need to understand what those criteria are and what the specific street situation is there as well. So, but thank you for bringing that up. I'm sorry if that impression was made that we were making that recommendation where we're not there yet. Mm -mm. Okay. Oh, you're muted, Renee. Oh, sorry. I wasn't talking about your presentation, Vera. I was talking about what's in the packet that's written by, I believe it's like from the consultants. I don't know, I don't remember the section exactly, but it doesn't it, it doesn't have any verbiage that allows for the fact that there needs to be some um, flexibility. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, I think the the yeah, the only um... I think the only thing from the consultants is the um, community engagement summary, but I will double check and make sure that we do that. Okay. Any other comments or questions or things that we should be thinking about in preparation for the June? meeting looks like we're good to go vera okay. for the evening we've got we've got two more meetings so we've got to get, right. get more but okay so then we've got the public comment period yeah, i think let's, i don't know if anybody's here good over um we do have an attendee ray atkinson is an attendee and I think, Mary, can you remind me, um, Miss um, Ray, if you have comments or questions, can um, can they raise their hand, Mary, to let me know if they have comments? I believe they can. Okay. Yeah. All right. So, Ray, I see that you're an attendee, and this is um, public comment time. So if you have comments or questions about the project or anything like that, this is an opportunity for you to to make those comments or ask those questions if you could use the raise your hand function. Um, all right, so I'm going to, give me a second and allow you to talk. Okay. Can you hear me? Yeah. Go ahead. Cool. So I didn't have a prepared speech, but I've been listening in tonight and it sounds like progress that's being made is uh, useful. And, you know, I'm looking forward to, you know, to stay involved with this process um, and professionally I work at Clackamas Community College and so you know interested in how to support uh, give my students and employees to the college uh, easier especially with like uh, you know east density along like transit routes so uh, you know students employees can more easily access transit without so they don't have to own a car for every trip um, so I'm really excited to look at the land use and transportation uh, intersection. So thank you. Thanks very much. Let's see, okay. All right. Well, um, at this point, I think we're actually, it's only 8.30, so I think maybe you're all gonna get 30 minutes back for tonight. Um, so again, our um, next meeting is uh, June 17th. Um, you'll be getting a packet um, the week before. Um, in the meantime, just wanted to let you know, so um, I will be at uh, Planning Commission on the 25th, so next Tuesday, to talk more about these things. So Joseph, 
See you next week. Talk some more about this stuff. Um, we are also, as part of um, this whole packet of kind of the DLCD code, I'm sort of just going to call it that for now, um, staff will be, um, we've asked for time on all of the NDA um, agendas in, in June. Lake Road does not meet in June, so we don't have an appointment with the Lake Road NDA, but for all of the other ones, we're asking for some time um, to kind of talk about what's coming um, in June. And then for the next part, we've got our next, um, or the sort of the final open house, which will similarly be talking about sort of the key ideas for this, um, for the code. And again, next steps and how people can participate. Um, there'll be an article on the pilot. Um, so just sort of letting folks know you as a committee that we're continuing to kind of share share all of this, the story of this code um, with everybody that will listen to us um, as we go. Um, and Vera, and, yeah. I was just going to interrupt mm. for a second. I think we kind of looked, we were looking at the calendar for July and trying to pick a date. So we were going to maybe, I think that that date was July. It was the 15th. Yes, um, July. I saw that it looks like Jennifer Dillon is out of town during that time too. So um we might, maybe we'll do some kind of a doodle poll to see when we can get the most participation because July is, I realize vacation time <laughs> for folks too. So um, July 15th would have been sort of the date that kind of lands and sort of at the same sort of Thursday that we generally meet. Um, but maybe I will suggest that um, I can do a doodle poll with everybody for July and see if there are a couple of dates where we can get the most people there. Um, so I'll apologize in advance if we end up not finding a date that everybody can be at, but I'll try to get the most people possible. Um, that's all right. And of um, course, Laura, it'll be recorded. Was, so was go for the 15th it. a day that we were um, shooting for scheduling with the NDA leaders? It was, but that seems to be moving around. That was one of the days, yes. But Joseph, that might be another okay, well, reason I wanna, why we can... I just want to make sure we don't schedule both of those meetings at the same time. Right. We will not schedule both of those meetings on the same day. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, yes. So I'll put together a doodle poll for everybody for July. Um, and then, and I will also commit to kind of double checking with um, the city manager and sort of, well, with Laura and everyone above me, sort of what will be the policy for in-person meetings in July. And we can see about, you know, how, how we might be able to do that too. And if folks are ready to come out <laughs> their houses and meet in a room, so we can do that too. Okay, all right. So if there is nothing else, I will entertain a motion to adjourn um, for the evening. So moved? Okay, great. So thanks everybody. Really appreciate everyone's time and energy um, as we continue moving on in this project and we'll see you in a few weeks. So, and please reach out to me if you need questions, emails, call, I'm always available. So let me know. Thanks everybody. Thanks, thanks. everybody. Have a good night. Thank Bye. you. Bye. Bye-bye.